Here we'll learn about skull development and its developmental anomalies. Start a table. Denote that we'll address skull malformation, specifically macrocephaly, megalencephaly, and microcephaly, and craniosynostosis, which refers to premature closure of the cranial sutures, which divides into disorders of a single suture, including trigonocephaly, plagiocephaly, scaphocephaly, and brachycephaly, and we'll touch on disorders that involve multiple sutures and astoses. To get a sense of the severity of skull defects that can occur, let's look at a three-dimensional model of premature closure of multiple sutures. We show a corresponding axial section through the skull as well. After we learn the synostoses, we'll draw them within this particular case. First, let's address the key skull malformations. Show that macrocephalies and cranial enlargement to greater than 98% of normal range. Show that although it can be due to enlargement of any of the three brain compartments, it's most commonly due to obstructive hydrocephalus. Enlargement of the gray and white matter of the brain, the parenchyma, is part of the next syndrome, megalencephaly. Show that here there's generalized cranial enlargement. It can be due to either anatomic abnormalities, for instance, neurocutaneous disorders, or metabolic abnormalities, for instance, lysosomal storage disorders or leukodystrophies. Show that microcephaly is a generalized, abnormally small cranium to less than 98% of normal range. It's typically due to a primary genetic cause, meaning a chromosomal abnormality or a metabolic abnormality, for instance, phenylketonuria, or an acquired condition, for instance, perinatal infection. Now let's address normal skull anatomy and development in sagittal view. To begin, let's divide the skull into the neurocranium, which protects the brain. It divides into a cranial vault, which provides a roof for the brain, and a skull base, which provides a floor, and a viscerocranium, which comprises the facial bones. Regarding skull development, the majority, the cranial vault and viscerocranium, develop via intramembranous ossification, again, which has no intermediate cartilaginous model whereas the skull base develops via endochondral ossification, which develops via a cartilaginous matrix. Now let's apply our knowledge of skull anatomy to this setup to learn about the skull sutures. Within the cranial vault, distinguish the frontal bone, parietal bone, upper portion of the occipital bone, and squamous portion of the temporal bone. All of these develop via intramembranous ossification. Indicate key bones of the skull base, which is far better viewed in horizontal section. They include the lower portion of the occipital bone, the petrous portion of the temporal bone, and the sphenoid bone. All of these bones develop via endochondral ossification. Distinguish key viscerocranial bones, the zygomatic bone and maxilla, and the mandible. They develop via intramembranous ossification. The bones of the face derive from embryonic cells from the pharyngeal arches, from neural crest cells, other than the laryngeal cartilages which derive from the mesoderm. Next, indicate that at birth the skull has opening sutures to accommodate brain growth because the flat bones of the cranial vault ossify so quickly. The sutures are from anterior to posterior, the metopic, coronal, sagittal, and lambdoid. These sutures accommodate skull distortion during birth, called molding, and permit rapid brain growth during the first two years of life when the brain quadruples its size to 75% of its adult volume. In addition to the sutures, let's learn the fontanelles, the large openings that exist in the newborn calvarium. Draw the superior aspect of the brain in axial view, from anterior to posterior, the frontal lobes, parietal lobes, and occipital lobes. Then show that the frontal bone covers the majority of the anterior frontal lobes. The parietal bones cover the remainder and the parietal lobes, and the occipital bone covers the occiput. Again, from anterior to posterior, show the metopic suture, which forms in midline of the frontal bone, it separates the left and right aspects. Show that the coronal suture lies between the frontal and parietal bones, sagittal suture between the bilateral parietal bones, and lambdoid suture between the parietal bones and occipital bones. 
then indicate that the anterior fontanelle forms at the junction of the sagittal, coronal, and metopic sutures. It's palpable in midline just behind the forehead. And it closes at a year and a half to two years of life. Show that the posterior fontanelle forms at the intersection of the sagittal and lambdoid sutures. It closes earlier at three to six months of age. Now let's draw the synostoses. First, scaphocephaly, the most common type. It accounts for half of the incidences of synostosis each year. Show that there's synostosis of the sagittal suture. We see that in accordance with Virchow's law, the interruption of brain growth is in perpendicular to the plane of the synostosis. Thus, the abnormal brain growth is in parallel to the synostosis. The skull elongates in parallel to the synodic suture. This results in an elongated, narrow skull. The skull is shaped like the narrow hull of a boat, the derivation of its name. Next show brachycephaly. It results from bicoronal synostosis. In this instance, the skull cannot develop normally along the sagittal plane, and we show instead that it manifests with a wide, short skull. Again, in accordance with Virchow's law, the skull develops in parallel to the plane of the synostosis. Now show that trigonocephaly is secondary to metopic synostosis, which results in a failure of frontal outward development. We show that it manifests with a pointed forehead. The eyebrows may appear pinched. To help link the name to the shape, show that trigonocephaly results in a triangular shaped head when viewed from above. Finally, show that in lambdoid synostosis, there's posterior plagiocephaly, a twisted skull due to an inability of a side of the occiput to grow outward, thus there is an oblique deformity of the posterior calvarial vault. As a practical matter, indicate that unilateral coronal synostosis also results in plagiocephaly, because as we can imagine, it results in a twisting and oblique appearance here of the frontal calvarium. With this knowledge base, now let's take another look at the radiographic images, show that metopic synostosis causes the forehead pinching. Bicoronal synostosis causes skull widening. Show this widening in the axial plane as well. This particular pattern of multi-suture closure is consistent with clover leaf deformity, which occurs when multiple sutures fuse prematurely. This concludes our diagram.